Hello, General Forestry. This is our next video in our radioactivity series, and we're going to be discussing decay chains and half-lives. So we started in our previous video, we discussed uh, radioactive decay, and we discussed two types, alpha decay and beta decay. And we know that alpha decay is when a large and stable element loses a helium atom, uh, two protons and two neutrons, in order to become more stable. And then beta decay is when a neutron reforms into a proton and an electron, and then the electron leaves. So we understand, or at least we've been introduced to uh, alpha and beta decay. This is a decay chain. And what that means is that sometimes an element will undergo alpha decay or beta decay, but the thing it becomes is still not stable. So it'll change into a new element, but that new element's not stable. So we have to keep going through the process. And there can be long, complicated chains of decay to lead to finally a stable atom. In this one, we're talk we start with neptunium. And if it undergoes alpha decay, it'll become protactinium, but then it's still not stable. And then it'll undergo beta decay to become uranium, still not stable. And then it'll lose you know, two protons and two neutrons to become thorium, still not stable. And then it will lose another helium atom to become radium-225, still not stable. And then it'll undergo beta decay, become actinium, still not stable. Alpha decay to become francium. Francium undergoes alpha decay to become astatine. And this continues. Astatine can undergo alpha decay to become bismuth-213. Now bismuth's got a choice. Sometimes bismuth undergoes alpha decay to become thallium-209, and sometimes bismuth undergoes um, beta decay to become polonium-213. So we've got a fork here, but both of the forks converge because polonium can undergo alpha decay to become lead-209, and thallium can, become, can undergo beta decay to become lead-209. So they, they split apart, but they re met each other at this lead, which can undergo beta decay to get out to a finally stable bismuth. This long series of decay that it takes to go from our neptunium to our stable bismuth, this is, this is a decay chain. So, at each one of these steps requires the math that we discussed earlier. In alpha decay, we've got to subtract two from the protons, 85 goes to 83, and because we're losing both two protons and two neutrons, our mass goes from 217 to 213, so that's how we get this bismuth to 213. And then in beta decay, we have a nucleus reforming into a proton and an uh, electron. Well, we add one proton, so 83 becomes 84, but because we both lose a neutron, which is one mass, and we gain a proton, which is one mass, our mass stays the same and then the electron leaves, so we don't have to worry about that. So we go from bismuth to polonium to 13. That is our decay chains. Now we're going to take a look at half-lives. Those decay chains show us what's happening to particular atoms that are going through this process. But we don't find one atom out there. We find big blocks of substances. We find billions or trillions of atoms all together in like one solid rock of something. Well, how do we describe what happens to that rock of billions or trillions of atoms over time? Well, that's half-life. Half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of a radioactive substance to decay. The amount of time it takes for half of a radioactive substance to decay. So different radioactive substances have different half-lives. Natrium-24 has a half-life of 15 hours. Half of it will be gone in 15 hours. Iodine-131 has eight days. So if you start with uh, 100 grams of natrium-24 and 100 grams of iodine-131, eight uh, half a day later, 15 hours later, half of the natrium will be gone. But you'll still have most of the iodine there because the iodine's not going to uh, get to its half point until eight days later. So you can see there's a wide variety of half-lives ranging here on this chart to 4.5 billion years uh, down to a matter of days. But there are some things that are so radioactive that they have um, half-lives of seconds or even milliseconds. So they're releasing energy and particles super fast if they have a low half-life like that. Um, so let's take a look at this. What's happening to the substance? Well, if we assume that each one of these is an atom of our radioactive substance, 
and all of them belong to the original substance. After one half-life, about half of them will have decayed to something else, and that's what the blue represents. The red is our radioactive, and the blue is our stable substance. Well, if we have another half-life, half of what's left will decay. And if we have another half-life, half of that will decay. So when we think of half, we usually think of two halves make a whole, but that's not how half-life works in radioactive decay. Half of it goes away, half of the radioactive substance goes away again, half of the radioactive substance goes away again. So it's not like two half-lives and it all, it's all done. No, it can take many, many, many half-lives before all the radiation is complete. So now we'll do a mixture. We'll look at this graph and we'll have the particle diagram. If this is 100% of our substances as a radioactive, we've got to start way up here on our graph where 100% is. In one half-life, and this could be any length of time because it changes depending on the isotope, one half-life, we've lost about half of them, so we've gone down to 50%. And then in another half-life, we've lost another half of them, so we go down to about 25%. And then in another half-life, we lose half of those, so we go down to about 12.5%. And so if we kept going, we'd have to cut that 12.5% to 6.25%, so on and so on and so forth. Eventually, all of them would change, but it's difficult to predict exactly when because of uh, there's a 50-50 chance that each particular atom will decay. So there you have it. That is half-life and decay chains. I hope this helps. Struggle well.